Okay. <clears throat> All right, I think it's time. Um, Hello and welcome everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our series Writing Slavery into Australian History. Uh, my name is Jane Lydon and I'm a historian um, at the University of Western Australia. So I'm going to share my screen. Seem to be muted again. Uh, Kate, I think you need to unmute me. Great. Um, all right, so I think you can all hear me now. Okay, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional country of the Wadjuk clan of the Noongar people of southwestern Australia. Uh, and you can see down here with the arrow where I'm pointing. I think it's crucial to keep First Nations history and continuing presence in mind when we're addressing history such as this. The Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery Project aims to explore links between the abolition of slavery in the British Empire and settler colonialism by tracing the movement of capital, people and culture from slave owning Britain to Western Australia. Over the next eight weeks, members of our team with two additional invited speakers will explore aspects of the forgotten history of British slavery and its colonial legacies. In August, 1833, British Parliament abolished slavery in the British Caribbean, Mauritius and the Cape. In place of slavery, the negotiated settlement established a system of apprenticeship and granted 20 million pounds in compensation to be paid by British taxpayers to the former slave owners. However, the celebration of British abolition, as we see here with these commemorative stamps, has overshadowed memories of the country's long prior history as the world's leading slave trading nation. Only slowly is Britain beginning to acknowledge the continuing significance of slavery and its impact for example, at the moment we're seeing controversy regarding uh, the National Trust in Britain, which published a report last September about connections to its properties and to slavery and imperialism, showing connections to 93 of its historic places. In response, Oliver Dowden, the British Secretary of State for Culture, told uh, the National Trust not to skew the public understanding of British history with a selective view focusing on matters such as slavery, but instead to provide a more rounded view of the UK's imperial history. He invited 25 of the UK's biggest heritage bodies and museums to a summit that was held just two days ago on Tuesday, uh, described by the Telegraph as British culture's last stand against woke zealotry. And I noticed that um, Dowden tweeted this tweet this morning uh, as his um, summary of the outcome. In Australia too, these histories remain controversial. As Black Lives Matter protests swept America and the world last year, many pointed out that the structural racism that sanctions black deaths in custody can be understood in part as a legacy of slavery. In June last year, the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison controversially stated that Australia, when it was founded as a settlement, as New South Wales was on the basis that there be no slavery. And while slave ships continued to travel around the world when Australia was established, yeah, sure, it was a pretty brutal settlement, but there was no slavery in Australia. In responding to Morrison, Indigenous leaders such as the Northern Territory Labor Senator, uh, Malandiri McCarthy, suggested that he would do well to look into the history of the country he is trying to lead. Truth telling must be an integral part of unifying our country, not dividing it. West Australian Labor Senator and Yaru leader Pat Dodson also said that there were numerous examples of Aboriginal people who were basically incarcerated, enslaved on pastoral properties under acts which indentured them to employers without any pay. These comments hint at the ways that celebrating the end of one archetypal form of unfreedom in the Caribbean 
simultaneously obscured and sanctioned other forms of exploitation. We have forgotten that the formal abolition of British slavery took place around 50 years after the establishment of Britain's settler colonies, which commenced in New South Wales in 1788. We have only recently begun to ask how slavery shaped colonization, let alone whether colonization played a role in abolition. Today, I want to sketch in some key points of connection between the British anti-slavery movement and the colonization of Australia from the late 18th century. I want to examine in particular the 1820s, a decade leading up to the foundation of a settler colony at Swan River in 1829, but also abolition in 1833. I'll then turn to our project and its biographical method, building in turn on the landmark legacies of British slave ownership project hosted at University College London. I'll present some of our work in progress, tracing the life journeys of the Ridley and Walcott families who moved from Demerara in what is now Guyana, back to England, and then onward to Western Australia in the first fleet in 1829. As historians of Caribbean slavery and its abolition have long, um, have long recognized its links, with the global expansion of industrial capitalism over the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And many acknowledge that the anti-slavery campaign which reached its triumphant climax in 1833 resolved a range of imperial and domestic problems for the ruling classes. As this, this timeline sort of sets out, on the 13th of May, 1787, the 11 ships now known as the First Fleet sailed from Portsmouth with their cargo of convicts, effectively initiating the British colonization of Australia. In the same month, the organized British anti-slavery movement began with the establishment by Granville Sharp, Quakers, and other evangelical Christians of the, the Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. In the months before the First Fleet departed, the first governor of New South Wales, Captain Arthur Phillip, advocated a future colonial society that would enjoy English liberty. So he said, the laws of this country will of course be introduced. Uh, and there's one in particular, that there can be no slavery in a free land and consequently no slaves. And of course, this is what uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison was alluding to in his comments last year. Phillips' assertion may at first sight appear odd given that Britain was not to abolish the trade, its trade for another 20 years, and the system of slavery for another 45 years. The British had first entered the transatlantic slave trade during the 16th century, and subsequently transformed it, enlisting state, naval, and military resources to protect the trade from rivals and the threat of revolt. Its most intense phase constituted the triangular trade, uh, so you can see here in this diagram, uh, ships would leave <clears throat> uh, British ports, such as Bristol, Liverpool, and so forth, and travel down to the west coast of Africa, where they would trade manufactured goods for their cargo of prisoners, enslaved Africans, which they would ship to the Caribbean. And of course, in the 18th century, uh, the Southern American states, uh, such as Virginia, were also considered part of the Caribbean. Uh, as were the newer colonies of Trinidad, Tobago, and Demerara on the north coast of South America. Uh, so by the time the British entered their own slave trade in 1807, they had shipped 3.25 million African people across the Atlantic. So what did Philip mean by the laws of this country? And what did he know of slavery? Philip himself, like many British sailors, had observed slavery at first hand in the Caribbean as a junior naval officer during the 1760s. And he had also served in the Portuguese Navy where he had traveled down to places um, in South America. Philip probably shared the general view that the condition of slavery did not exist under English law, which spread following the, land, the landmark Somerset case. In 1771, James Somerset a slave who had an enslaved person who had escaped in England from his owner, approached Granville Sharp seeking to prevent his forcible return to slavery. Lord Mansfield, Chief Justice of the Court of the King's Bench, ruled that the state of slavery is of such a nature 
that it is incapable of being now introduced by justice upon mere reasoning. It must take its rise from positive law. He thus contributed to the popular view that slavery was incompatible with English liberty. Philip may also have known about the horrifying case of the Zong, which contributed to the growing public profile of the anti-slavery movement. Uh, and here in this painting, this famous painting by Turner, such an incident was depicted in, in, um, uh, in his, his much later uh, scene, which was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1840. So he painted this well after abolition had been achieved. So in 1781, Captain Collingwood, sailing from West Africa with a cargo of prisoners, had thrown um, in, in a series of incidents over you know, three, at least three separate occasions, around 133 men, women and children overboard. The insurers refused to pay and a trial resulted in a finding for the slave owners. The freed African Alada Equiano went to Sharp and with the insurers, they brought a motion for a new trial, which was also heard by Mansfield in July 1783. In his opening remarks, Solicitor General John Lee reminded the court that the case of slaves was the same as if horses had been thrown overboard. After a two day hearing, however, Mansfield recommended a new trial, which the ship owners never dared to bring. From Britain's first plans to establish a penal colony in Australia, ideas about its future were closely linked to contemporary debates about abolition. Both the anti-slavery movement and the transportation of British convicts to Australia emerged during the 1780s, a decade that followed the American Revolution and preceded the French and Haitian revolutions. The coevalness of transportation and anti-slavery movements expresses the growing concern to define the rights of British subjects as the empire expanded. Philip's brief and puzzling comments, which he never repeated, were part of a longer passage that you see here, in which he defined convicts as morally undeserving and contemptible, and yet also British subjects with irreducible rights. So his famous comments actually followed this less well-known passage where he's talking about the way that convicts didn't really deserve to join uh, civil society, even after the seven or 14 years for which they were transported may be expired. So he was anticipating that they would live apart in a form of apartheid. Utopian visions for the colony were inspired by the revolutionary politics of the last quarter of the 18th century. This is what Deirdre Coleman has termed romantic colonization, expressed here by Wedgwood's 1789 Sydney Cove medallion. So here we see hope encouraging art and labour under the influence of peace uh, in, in this rather high flown vision of, uh, of New South Wales's future. And it was accompanied by a poem by Erasmus Darwin in which he too talked about you know, these very romantic ideas of the way the colony would be. But like many others, Philip saw convicts as the wrong stuff to lay the foundations of an empire and they were increasingly disqualified from membership in civil society over these years, and their status frequently likened to that of slaves, justified on moral grounds. This harsher and evangelical view was expressed by the Great Seal of New South Wales as an everyday symbol of authority intended to encourage convicts to work hard and therefore reinstate themselves in civil society. So as we see here, a much more business-like view um, of industry, uh, sort of hope and peace have disappeared. And instead we see these attributes of hard work. There's a man plowing, um, plowing a field with oxen in the background, ships and their cargo riding at anchor and the fort uh, and buildings in the background. And we see convicts in everyday dress uh, with their fetters taking, ta um, taken off. The closest convict kneels in the posture of Wedgwood's abject slave from his famous uh, medallion and logo for the anti-slavery movement, but the convict shown in the act of removing his fetters. Rather than pleading with the white philanthropist, as on Wedgwood's famous medallion, the convicts will free themselves, pursuing hard work and discipline as a means to liberation. The interchangeability of the slave and the convict in this iconography points toward their shared 
and fluid status at this time. Many have argued that the anti-slavery movement served an important purpose for Britain's elite, concerned to maintain the social order against the transformations of industrial capitalism. Eric Williams' landmark 1947 study, Capitalism and Slavery, argued on economic grounds that slavery was key to generating the Industrial Revolution. Building on Williams' basic insight, historians such as David Brian Davis and many others have subsequently argued that Britain's conversion to anti-slavery ideology was related to the Industrial Revolution's need to legitimise wage labour and the bitter struggle over domestic reform. Many have noted the contradiction between elite parliamentarians' concern for the enslaved of the Caribbean and their oppressive maintenance of the domestic British social order, tracing the complex process in which the boundaries of freedom were redrawn. If we expand this frame of analysis to global processes of emigration and settler colonialism, it is clear that as anti-slavery cemented the enslaved African as an archetype of oppression, it sanctioned new slaveries and injustices produced by British imperial aspirations. Abolition was a potent source of moral capital and became one of the vital underpinnings of British supremacy in the Victorian era. But the price of this new dichotomy between enslaved and free was paid by those who were considered not yet deserving of freedom, such as convicts, the poor, non-white workers and Australian Indigenous people. Ultimately, abolition sanctioned new forms of unfree labour. The growing concern with the relationship between British anti-slavery and settler colonial histories has begun to emerge. As Catherine Hall has argued, we must consider the histories of slavery um, of the Caribbean alongside those of the colonies of Australia, Canada and South Africa and examine how the end of slavery redirected capital, people and ambitions toward the colonies. The Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project founded by Catherine Hall, Keith McClelland and Nicholas Draper and based at University College London has provided an important model for exploring the aftermath of abolition, centering upon a biographical method. So this is obviously a screenshot from the website that is publicly accessible. The core of the project is, the, is a database of digitised slave compensation records from the 1830s, which document both the awards to around 47,000 slave owners, as well as more detailed information regarding around 3,000 absentee planters living in Britain and emancipation. The database records the identity of all slave owners in the British Caribbean at the time slavery ended, amassing and analysing information about their activities, affiliations and legacies. The Lassels family provides one of the most spectacular examples of the links between slavery wealth, political power and British culture. So um, you can see here a screenshot from the database searching on the surname Lassels. And uh, the large number, the, 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 um, the very strong representation that particular family has in the database. The Lassels amassed a fortune from their sugar plantations in Barbados from the mid-17th century. Edwin Lassels used some of this wealth to build Harwood House between 1759 and 1771, becoming the first Baron Harwood uh, in 1790. The family remains wealthy and influential, for example, the sixth Earl married Princess Mary, the daughter of King George V, while the family sold their last Caribbean plantation only in 1975. But this example is not typical of the Australian legacies of British slavery. Just want to emphasise, we're looking at a very different um, historical process uh, in, uh, in terms of colonial legacies. The LBS database has been an important starting point for our own new Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery project, which aims to trace the movement of slavery wealth, but also people, attitudes and practices from the Caribbean to the new colonies of Australasia. And here is our new website, again, just a screenshot. Um, our website was just launched a couple of days ago. 
Specifically, we are examining links to Western Australia, which was invaded or colonised in 1829, when the Swan River settlement was established on the traditional country of the Noongar people. Our primary method is to trace life stories that instantiate some of the, these larger patterns of movement. So here you see uh, the database and the different fields or variables that you can search on. Uh, and if you type Western Australia into the node search, you produce a list of a number of individuals who have already been identified uh, as linked to Western Australia. These are uh, beneficiaries uh, of slave compensation money, of course. <clears throat> uh, intriguingly, uh, so this is the list. Uh, intriguingly, two families were noted in the LBS as what appears to have been a group of people moving from Demerara to Western Australia. And you can see that here. Uh, and these were the families of Charles Dawson Ridley, attorney, and of James Walcott, slave owner. These two families travelled together on Western Australia's first fleet aboard the Wanstead in 1829. The men were business partners, but also, we think, brothers-in-law. They were among the first large land grantees in the colony. James Walcott, again from the LBS, uh, was recorded as owner of the Good Hope Sugar Plantation in Demerara as late as 1817, and of the St Christopher Estate as late as 1826, with John Walcott, probably his brother. John, uh, who remained in Demerara, was awarded £7,256 and more for 134 enslaved people in November 1835. So it's likely that James bought his brother out in 1826. Charles Ridley is recorded as administrator or attorney as late as 1826 of Turkayen and Henrietta and of Rees on Hoop, both estates or plantations in Demerara. Attorneys were at the top of the Caribbean plantation management system, responsible for managing absentee owners' estates. As landlords increasingly left the region, by 1832, over 80% of the large sugar plantations had absentee owners, allowing attorneys to amass significant wealth. Neither Ridley nor Walcott were recorded as owners or managers after 1826, suggesting that they may have divested themselves of their property around that time. Their extended families, however, retained interests in Demerara and Jamaica, and indeed, they may have as well. Uh, as this map shows, Guyana, down here on the south, uh, is now part of, um, Demerara is now part of Guyana. Founded by the Dutch in 1740, Guyana only became, or Demerara only became a British colony in 1814. It was a frontier colony and much of its tropical rainforest required extensive clearing before it could be cultivated with a commensurate heavy toll on workers. So this was a particularly cruel uh, slave, slave regime. And uh, in 1823, it was the setting for one of the greatest slave rebellions ever. It began on John Gladstone's plantation success, uh, which is in here, um, I'll show you in a moment, uh, and spread along the intensively cultivated East Coast. It was quickly and brutally repressed. Satellite photographs like this one reveal the former plantations along the coast and how they maximised access to water transport. So you can see these long, skinny allotments um, with their narrow water frontage extending along both sides of the Demerara River as well. Uh, and here we have Reed on Hoop. Uh, which Ridley managed, Breed on Hope means peace and hope, uh, which is today a town on the west side of the mouth of the Demerara River, uh, which he sold in 1828 to Sir John Gladstone. And of course, Sir John Gladstone was the father of the British, British Prime Minister and was also the first to introduce uh, indentured non-white labour to Reed on Hope um, to replace slave labour after abolition. Uh, Joshua Bryant's 1823 map, 
also shows what was formerly Ridley's Turkhain and Henrietta property. Uh, so this red cross here, uh, and with Bryant's key to the map on the right. Uh, and Walcott's former Good Hope uh, plantation number 28. So these are the sites marked with the Red Cross. Uh, I haven't yet been able to find St Christopher's, which could well lie beyond this particular map. But um, the yellow marks, crosses, um, indicate sites of particularly intense conflict during the rebellion in 1823, prior to um, these families divesting themselves. So it seems likely that they were, in, they were caught up in the rebellion and possibly decided to leave uh, as a result. This is just uh, my speculation at the moment. Their family trees show their children and where they were born, helping us map their movement across the globe. So Charles Ridley was born in, 18, uh, in 1787 in London, as you can see here uh, on the family tree. He married Mary, Elizabeth, Mary Eliza Forrester, who was born in 1801 in Demerara in September 1816. They departed Demerara in July 1817, having sold their possessions earlier that month. However, they seem to have remained or returned because three children were born in Demerara between 1819 and 1823. One was then born in London in 1828 and five in Western Australia between 1833 and 1846. In September 1830, Ridley was awarded 1,750 acres on the Swan River. According to avail available genealogical research, Walcott's Brady family tree, again a publicly um, accessible family tree, shows he married Johanna Perry, born 1803 in Demerara, and they had their first child, Elizabeth Elliot Walcott, in Demerara in 1818. Uh, the next six children, however, were born between 1820 and 1828 in Devon, suggesting absentee management and divestment of their property in Demerara over this period. Their eighth child, a son, Robert, was born in 1829 in Western Cape Town in South Africa, presumably en route to Western Australia aboard the Wanstead. Their last three children were born in Western Australia between 1831 and 1836. So this information is supported generally by Western Australian researchers um, conducting this, this kind of genealogical investigation. However, we have struck a significant discrepancy which we have yet to resolve. My colleague Zoe Laidlaw, also um, a chief investigator on our project, has been researching the colonial Demerara and Essequibo newspapers, which in April 1815 published bans of matrimony between James Walcott and Miss Johanna Forrester, with the permission of her father, Lewis, uh, because she was a minor. In fact, she was around 12 years old. So um, we have not yet worked out which of these is correct, whether she changed, her, there was a name change, or we, we don't quite know what's going on. But the fact remains that she was a daughter of a property owner in Demerara, uh, who married another slave owner, James Walcott. Uh, they let, and and they, they then moved to Britain and then out to Western Australia. Okay, so I wanna move out now to look at the 1820s context. This was a crucial decade in the broad redefinition of the terms of labor employment revealing the implication of the elite abolitionist movement within both domestic political repression and colonial exploitation. In 1823, the abolitionist campaign was revitalized with the foundation of the Anti-Slavery Society, led by figures such as Thomas Fowle Buxton and Zachary Macaulay, whose parliamentary work and publications they hoped would mitigate and eventually end slavery. And indeed, um, this work that they began in 1823 is linked to um, the outbreak of the rebellion in Demerara that same year, as slaves heard rumours of their um, impending freedom. This marked the onset of the abolitionist campaign's so-called gradualist phase, a compromise between the anti-slavery lobby and the West India interest, in which both sides agreed that slaves needed to be civilised and Christianised before they were freed. 
Amid the social turmoil that followed the Napoleonic Wars, there was rising unrest among the working classes in Britain. Intense popular agitation over these years aimed to reform the corrupt and exclusive political system, prompting increasingly harsher official measures. Official repression reached a climax in the so-called Peterloo Massacre in Manchester in 1819, where a, a peaceful rally of almost 60,000 people seeking parliamentary reform was violently dispersed by troops, as depicted here by Cruikshank, uh, and in fact commemorated a couple of years ago by Mike Lee's film of that name. Radicals and the pro-slavery lobby contrasted workers with slaves, seeking to focus attention on the plight of British workers, which they asserted was similar to or worse than that of Caribbean slaves. And you can see here uh, Wedgwood's logo um, was the basis for this. Again, another drawing by Cruikshank, uh, which showed a kneeling demonstrator being cut down at Peterloo saying, am I not a man and a brother? So echoing the words that ran around the logo of Wedgwood's medallion, uh, but with the response from the trooper, no, you are a poor weaver. Powerful radical voices, such as that of journalist and farmer William Cobbett, attacked the anti-slavery movement and Wilberforce in particular. As the movement emphasized the distinction between slave and free labor, yet advocated the disciplining of white workers. An overlooked aspect of this antagonism is the way that transportation to the colonies and especially the harsh reduction of convict rights after 1820 functioned to further the conservative anti-slavery cause by subduing domestic dissent and reinforcing the class order. During the 1820s, the convict system became increasingly harsh, even as the numbers of transported convicts rose sharply, as you can see here in Hamish Maxwell Stewart's fabulous table. So um, after 1800, we see this spike in the numbers of transported convicts, which peaks and then diminishes after abolition, the abolition of slavery. At this time, the Australasian colonies were increasingly seen as sites of investment and exploitation, as were not just um, penal settlements. And anti-slavery leaders, including Wilberforce, invested in large agricultural stations worked by convicts, such as the Australian Agricultural Company, formed in 1824. <clears throat> so in echo of the Caribbean plantation. So in 1826, when the young captain James Stirling was commissioned to relieve the failed settlement of Fort Dundas on Melville Island, he saw the mission's financial potential. Aware of the new colonial investment ventures, <clears throat> Stirling arrived in Sydney already armed with a proposal for colonisation of the West Coast, even before he'd, he'd ever seen the place and focused upon strategic defence and trade with India, <clears throat> where his father-in-law had interests with the East India Company. Sterling himself was clearly alive to the opportunities <clears throat> to repair his family's finances when he became the colony's first governor. <clears throat> Excuse me. His own family had made their fortune when Sterling's paternal great-grandfather, Andrew Buchanan, uh, became one of Glasgow's famous tobacco lords who dominated the trade to the American colonies. Uh, and in the LBS, uh, James's older brother, Walter, who ran the family business, uh, by then focused on manufacturing, um, was in 1834 the beneficiary of claims in Barbados and British Guiana, so Demerara. But in 1825, the family business was faced with ruin. And I just want to note that in our fourth seminar, uh, Dr. Georgina Arnott, uh, who is a postdoc on our project, will explore Sterling's career and connections in more detail. So please do tune in for that. <clears throat> Swan River was the first British colony in Australia founded exclusively for private settlement based upon a land grant system although under government control with labour to be supplied by the white working class. So here we see just a panorama of the, the port of Fremantle in its early days. 
Settlers were granted land in proportion to the value of assets and labour that they brought to the colony and were required to improve their grants in order to secure full title. Its status as the first free colony untainted by convicts uh, was a selling point. They modelled their schemes on the plantation, as did these New South Wales precedents, such as the Australian Agricultural Company and Thomas Potter McQueen's Hunter Valley Agricultural Estate, Sagan Ho. So what did the Ridleys and Walcotts do in Western Australia? <clears throat> uh, as, a, as a major landowner, Ridley was actively involved in driving the colony's agricultural development and especially <clears throat> the diverse and increasingly desperate schemes to secure labour that characterise this phase of Western Australia's history. And again, I want to note that my colleague Jeremy Martins, um, a CI on our project, will be exploring this process and particularly its impact on Noongar people um, further along in the seminar series, in his seminar on the 11th of March. <clears throat> Ridley also sought to develop new industries, such as an export trade in Jarrah, which is um, a beautiful timber that grows in southwestern Western Australia. And eventually he advocated experiments in sugar. So he said that he'd initially discouraged it because of its association with laziness from his observation in Barbados. Uh, but <clears throat> he changed his mind and advocated its cultivation uh, based on his experience um, acquired during residence of more than 20 years in one of the sugar colonies. This didn't, um, sugar did not become an industry cultivated in Western Australia, but during the 1860s, another Western Australian resident from the Caribbean, Archibald Burt, was to grow sugar cane just for fun, not in an industrial scale. Um, and you can see here a photograph uh, of, of him standing beside a, a stand of sugar cane in his residence on Adelaide Terrace in Perth in 1862. <clears throat> okay, so getting back to the Ridleys and Walcotts. Uh, in late 1835, there was a dispute regarding an agreement to erect a party fence between the adjoining grounds of the party. So this signals that some kind of um, dispute between the two, but they were still neighbors in February, 1837, when a fire broke out at Walcotts residence on the Swan River. Uh, opposite Guildford. James Walcott was granted land in both the Swan and Avon districts. Uh, he speculated and eventually incurred considerable debts, forcing him to sell his Avon holding by auction in 1839 for £16,000. Walcott left the colony for Mauritius in 1837, selling nearly 5,000 hectares, which had originally been known as the Walcott Estate south of York. He had also been granted 448 hectares in the Upper Swan region, where his principal uh, residence was located. However, Walcott and his family remained behind, judging by their places of death, mostly in Western Australia. And I might note too that um, members of the Walcott and Ridley families intermarried. They were probably cousins if indeed their mothers were sisters, but um, so um, here on this uh, uh, aerial photograph, you can see the red cross marks, uh, the Walcott Estate, south of York, and the yellow cross, um, and his farm, Yangadin, and the yellow cross marks um, the estate granted to Ridley uh, as the Avon Valley was invaded and, and settled, uh, and, and Ridley's farm was called Bailey. Uh, and again, Jeremy Martins will be exploring this process in his seminar. Uh, Swan River's poor agricultural land and lack of resources meant that the vision of large estates and a gentlemanly lifestyle uh, failed. Many workers simply left their masters and, and Western Australia was, uh, was often judged a failure, an object lesson from which others learned. Notably, as Stirling's fleet prepared to sail to Swan River in 1829, the problem of colonisation was taken up by Edward Gibbon Wakefield, languishing in Newgate Prison for the abduction of a 15-year-old heiress. In developing his scheme of systematic colonisation, Wakefield attacked Adam Smith's arguments that colonies thrive where they take possession of vacant 
or thinly populated land, pointing out that Smith had overlooked the role of slave labour in making his calculations. Wakefield also directly refuted Smith's famous argument for the superiority of, of free labour. Instead, Wakefield advocated principles of land commoditization and a system for selling land only for a sufficient price in order to compel what he termed concentrated or disciplined labour, including non-white labour, uh, uh, to, to, to work for the capitalists. So this is a scheme that echoed the Caribbean plantation regime. Wakefield's principles were invoked in debates around the 1833 Abolition Act, and Western Australian experience supposedly showed how freed slaves in the Caribbean would not work unless motivated by being forced to labour, resulting in an apprenticeship period being inserted into the bill. In other words, uh, by only making land available to those with capital, the poorer um, members of society would be forced to work for wages um, on the land um, of, of the land of, of the uh, of the gentry and the capitalist class. <clears throat> uh, and so, and this was this was cited in debates around the Abolition Act in 1833. Um, so Wakefield's principles were also applied in the Caribbean after emancipation by planters in the new colonies of Trinidad and British Guiana, that is Demerara. In sum, Wakefield's scheme for systematic colonization was a solution to the problem of abolition and the economic loss it threatened, pointing to shared techniques of exploitation applied in both the old world colonies of the Caribbean and the new settler colonies. For Wakefield, Swan River was a joke. It was also in competition with his own schemes. Wakefield ridiculed the failure of the colonists to recreate the British social order with its docile, disciplined workers. But our project aims to re-examine examine such judgments. Were colonists really so inept in exploiting indigenous country and people? The Ridleys and Walcotts may have abandoned Demerara and its cruel, cruel slave regime only to find themselves implicated in a new and equally exploitative enterprise in the colonies. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm now going to stop sharing um, and, uh, and I'm chairing myself. So um, I'm now going to, um, to stop talking and call for any questions. Um, that I, I see that there is one in the question and answer, uh, the question and answer box. So I'll just start with that perhaps. But if anyone has a question, would you please either um, raise your hand or type it in the Q&A box? Um, and Kate, who is hosting this session, is also going to, um, to keep an eye out for those two. So the first question is from Stephanie Jones Rogers, um, who says, I'm wondering, why was Western Australia so alluring for British slave owners in Demerara? Were slave owners in other colonies equally attracted to Western Australia? If not, why do you think that is? Um, so that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I think that Western Australia is only one part of the story. So although our project is focusing on Western Australia, uh, there's, um, uh, there's, we know that there was investment of compensation funds from slavery in all of the colonies. Uh, and recently researchers have begun to explore that. So for example, Alan Lester and Nikita Vanderbilt have recently published research about um, investment in the Wakefieldian colony of South Australia. And they've concluded that uh, although this money was significant, it's only part of a larger reorientation of investment from one part of the empire to another. So um, I think we could see it as part of the settler revolution. Um, and I think the specific answer to the question of Western Australia is that when it was colonized, it was, it was boosted and promoted as being the first free colony 
And I think many were taken in by this. It, it, the reality proved to be rather different. Um, and, and so many of them invested in the colony and then those such as Ridley and Walcott decided to stay and make their lives in the colony, whereas others left. Uh, some people heard rumours that it wasn't working out and they changed their minds even in, even in the Cape. Some people got off the, the ship and uh, turned around and went home again or decided to go on to Tasmania or other colonies. Um, so, and the question, were slave owners in other colonies equally attracted to Western Australia? No, they too saw it as a failure initially. Some of the early colon uh, colonists to Western Australia, like the Henty family, then went on to Tasmania. So it was really um, a matter of weighing up where their best bet might have been um, and making decisions in, in light of the best available information. I hope that's sort of answered the question um, a little bit. I mean, a, a great deal remains to be done and um, we're hoping that during our seminar series over the next eight weeks, different aspects of this investment and these sorts of um, patterns will be elucidated by our different speakers. So next week, Emma Christopher will be talking about Queensland uh, and very direct links to the sugar industry in the tropical zone of Queensland. Um, I'm going to move on now to, I don't see a, a place here for, oh, and Emma Christopher has also just said there were lots of people from British Guinea in, in Guiana, British Guiana in Queensland as well. Uh, so thank, thanks very much, Emma. Uh, so <clears throat> I think it's interesting actually, just reflecting on if we see Wakefield uh, as embodying some of these shared interests between the end of Caribbean slavery and the onset of settler colonialism, clearly there are many shared, there are many similarities between the so-called new colonies of Demerara, where they had to clear the rainforest and places like Queensland and Western Australia. Uh, so, so as Emma points out, there are very likely to be these links, you know, seen most clearly uh, in Queensland as well. Um, I'm going to move on now to Fiona Paisley's question, which is, would I say more about that last image? Thanks very much for that question. And actually, um, I will share my screen again and look at it. It is a very shocking image. Uh, and uh, it's and very unsettling. So this is actually a hand coloured lantern slide of an image that was produced around the turn of the century and shows a group of Aboriginal prisoners from Wyndham in northwestern Western Australia taken around the turn of the century. Uh, it was also published in newspapers around 1900 in the context of debate about the treatment of prisoners. At the time, very counterintuitively, it was used to to demonstrate the humane treatment of Aboriginal prisoners. It shows a, a bathing gang. So these were men being taken off to, to bathe um, in the sea. Uh, and it, it, it also reassured colonists that um, British law was being upheld. When we look at it now, we see, we are shocked by the parallels with slavery in the Caribbean and the treatment of enslaved Africans. Um, I would just say that um, I began researching this image a long time ago uh, in the late um, uh, 2000s and uh, consulted with Aboriginal groups in the Kimberley. The, the men in this photograph were um, they are unidentified, but they were drawn from across the Kimberley. So the, the message from elders in community, in Aboriginal communities um, from the region was, that they want this history to be told as part of truth telling and they see this image as part of that process. So um, that is why we have made this, this image um, available. It was also reproduced on the cover of Chris Owen's book about the invasion and killing times in the Kimberley and the process of frontier violence. Uh, his book is called Every Mother's Son is Guilty uh, and since that was published, the image has become very, very widely shared on social media and in the public domain. Uh, so we see that now uh, shared a lot, again, as a kind of an icon of colonial injustice. 
Um, I hope that answers the question. Do feel free to ask more about it. Um, Ian Hoskins says, is there any direct or indirect link between Enmore and Annandale and Demerara and those properties in Sydney? And that is a very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, I do not know the answer to that. Um, I, did, I, I did notice actually in looking at those properties um, and reading about the rebellion that, uh, that, that they are the same names and presumably they're named after places in Britain. So that I'm afraid I, I can't answer that question now, but it's certainly an interesting one to follow up uh, for future research. Zoe Laidlaw, thank you Zoe, says, can you explain a bit more about how the legacies of slavery in Western Australia stretch forwards in time as well? So thank you Zoe, that's, that's a great question. So I've just focused on that very um, precise moment, trying to tie together people who were actually slave owners in Demerara, who then came out, who received compensation or whose families did, who then came out to Western Australia in a very direct way. But we're also seeing a much less direct pattern uh, that, that Zoe and Georgiana and other members of our team have already begun to explore where individuals who might have benefited from slavery or retained interest in the Caribbean then came out to Western Australia later on, such as Archibald Burt, uh, for example. So those um, investments. Um, Mary Ann Broom, the wife of one of the governors, is another very good example of that kind of link. Uh, and, and these people are all in the LBS database. But what we're also finding is that there are people who are emerging uh, who were possibly slave owners who divested before compensation, so they don't appear in the LBS, and then later came out to Western Australia, or those who, um, who chose to come out here or to invest um, later in the 19th or even the 20th century. Um, Alec O'Halloran asks, to what extent were local Indigenous people coerced into land labour in early days of Swan River Colony? Thank you very much for that question. That is a really important part of the process. Um, and I think uh, it's often said that in, in broad terms, settler colonialism uh, led to the elimination of Indigenous people rather than the exploitation of their labour. But in Western Australia, that was not the case. Um, not so much in the Perth area or, or the site of the settlement, but as, as colonists began to invade countries spreading out from Perth, as Jeremy will be discussing in more detail, um, we start to see that uh, not only did conflict take place, but they began to put Noongar to work. And in fact, they spoke, colonists spoke highly of Indigenous West Australians as a labour source. This was a, um, a mark of their, of their progress. And of course, as uh, invasion spread north into um, northwestern Western Australia, indige Indigenous labour became crucial uh, and so-called indenture was widely employed. But of course, it was a fictitious kind of indenture uh, because as the comments of Malandiri McCarthy uh, and Pat Dodson that I quoted at the beginning of the seminar alluded to, uh, it was indenture or free labour only in name and their practices in fact did recreate many practices from Caribbean slavery. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question now if I can master my mouse. I think the next question there Oh, sorry. Uh, had Mauritius been a slave colony and were, was that why Walcott went there? Rob Smith, thank you. Um, yes, it was. Mauritius was also the site of experimentation for uh, indentured labour uh, from 1834. So it was really the earliest uh, place where people began to, ex or one of the most well-known places where experiments in indentured labour took place. We actually don't know why Walcott went there. Uh, he went there and he came back. He died in Western Australia. Uh, but it's quite, I mean, I'm speculating, but it, I think it's quite likely that he went there in order to try to secure um, a supply of labour because that was Western Australia's great problem. Uh, um, Pedro Mercado, 
why, uh, Pedro Mercado asks, while the project is focused on Caribbean Western Australian connections, is there any sense of linkages through slave interests between India or indeed more broadly in the Western Indian Ocean and Australia? Uh, so for example, and he says um, in the 17th and late 18th century, East India Company ships carried over, th over 3,000 Malagasy, Mozambicans, Comorian and even West African slaves to India and to its factories in Java and Sumatra. What happened to these interests in the 19th century? Thank you, that's a fantastic question. And in fact, we're very conscious that Western Australia, our study site, our pilot study, if you like, is embedded in that Indian Ocean context. Uh, and indeed, as I mentioned, James Sterling's family, he married into the Mangles family. Um, his wife, Ellen Mangles um, family was very much involved in the East India Company. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, it, it had its own very complex systems of labour transport. So yes, we're embedding our project very much in that, that spectrum of coercive labour practices. Um, and a range of scholars from Claire Anderson to Hugh Tinker have pointed out the way that uh, convict labour and enslaved labour are only, um, you know, these are only uh, two, two categories or two forms of what was actually a broad spectrum of forced labour practices. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, there are many linkages and this is an explicit focus of research. Our PhD student attached to the project, Aoife Nugent, uh, in fact, has enrolled to explore precisely these, these kinds of questions. Uh, so we hope to elucidate that. <clears throat> I think we have time for a couple more questions. Oh, Pedro Mercado, I should add that East India Company ships also shipped Indian slaves to company factories at Bantam and Ben Coolan during the 17th and 18th centuries. Yes, thank you very much for that. Um, I think what, one of the interesting things I'd, I'd just add is that um, at the time that the settler colonies were being established, this is obviously a period of adjustment and transition. Uh, Alan Esther's new book, Governing, Ruling the World, um, examines this moment and the reorientation during the 1830s of imperial administration uh, and the way that um, these different categories are being drawn and redrawn. So white convicts, um, white labour to the settler colonies and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> And there's much more to say about that, but we're running out of time. Jennifer McLaren um, asks, it seems quite a few plantation owners quit their investments in Demerara post-rebellion mid-1820s, but their compensations wouldn't have been received for another decade. Do you think they decided to venture to the Australian colonies before they received their compensation funds or their travels to Australian colonies needed funds to travel. So again, um, I hope I, I wasn't too confusing with the sequence in, in my talk. Yes, the Ridley, um, Charles Dawson Ridley and James Walcott seem to have divested in 1826. They're in the LBS database, not as beneficiaries, but as related to beneficiaries. And um, the, the records of their prior ownership are in there. Uh, in 1833, members of their family, such as James' probable brother, John Walcott, were direct beneficiaries. So I would speculate that they divested after the rebellion or in the context of the horrible conditions that led to the rebellion uh, and went back to Britain. They, they took their, their proceeds and went home to Britain. And then when the colony was founded uh, and advertised as a free colony in Australia, they decided that that was a suitable site of, in, of investment. Um, and then as Zoe sort of pointed out in her question, at the point of 1833, we um, compensation funds flowed to individuals who then may have also invested in the colonies. And so South Australia, I think, is a particularly intriguing example where people like Alan Lester and Nikita Vanderbilt have begun to um, and a number of other researchers, um, Philip Jones, uh, Beth Robertson, based in, in Adelaide, have begun to explore these kinds of links as well and the very, um, the timing of compensation and then investment in the settler colonies. <clears throat>
So I hope that's a bit clearer. I'm just going to take one last question now because we're out of time. I'm sorry about, oh, sorry about that. Um, Rowena Hall, will there be more discussion looking at slavery connections to the pearling industry in Cossack? Um, yes, there will be. And that's very much part of our, of our research remit. So we certainly hope in the next three years to have many conversations um, about that. So I'm gonna finish up now. Um, there are so many interesting questions I don't wanna finish, but Lynette Russell says, do we have plans to add to the LBS database with the material we have uncovered? So um, no, we're not. We did explore that. Uh, and in fact, uh, originally we were thinking about setting up our own database. What we are doing though, we're, we're working in partnership with the Centre for Biography at ANU and the um, Australian Dictionary of Biography. We will contribute, or jo and particularly Georgina Arna will contribute uh, a series of biographies to the ADB, but we will also contribute our data about these individuals to People Australia, which is also um, a very inclusive database connected to, um, to the centre in Canberra. Uh, and we can actually link to the LBS from that, but we're still exploring that process. Uh, and I can see that there are more people asking questions. Um, Emma says, I'm wondering how open people were about their background. Well, actually, um, I did, so that's a very interesting question. And um, I was very intrigued by Beth Robertson's research about her ancestor who went to South Australia because he was a descendant of enslaved people in the Caribbean and he did hide that mixed race ancestry. Uh, but just thinking about that right now, Emma, I did quote Ridley being very open about his experience in the West Indies and using that as a way of advocating sugar cultivation. So it seems not. Uh, certainly, I would think in Western Australia, uh, yeah, so I, I would be speculating to answer at greater length there. So I'm going to finish now um, and just say thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. And I'm very sorry if we didn't get to them, uh, but there will be more opportunities with Emma's, Emma Christopher's seminar next Thursday and then the rest of the seminars over the next couple of months uh, to talk further about these issues. Thank you very much and we might stop there. Bye.